Hello and welcome everybody to uh, who's joined us today at uh, Lymphoma Canada for today's webinar, Making Wise Decisions About Complementary Therapies When Living with Lymphoma. Uh, we're really pleased to have Dr. Linda Balnews here today. Uh, before we start, I'd like to just go over a couple of details about the presentation. Uh, we are recording this webinar, so it, and it will be posted on our website, Lymphoma Canada's website, so you can view it later if you wish. Uh, as well, a handout of the slides is posted in the handout section of the toolbar on the right-hand side of your page. Uh, so you don't need to take notes, or you don't, certainly don't need to write any of the information that's on the slide down during the presentation. And also, if you have any questions, um, please enter them in the question uh, box in your toolbar at any point during the presentation. And after Dr. Balnese has finished her presentation, she will answer as many as she can. Uh, and just to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Linda Balnese is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy at the University of Toronto. She's also the inaugural director of the Center of Integrative Medicine, a collaboration of the University of Toronto as well as the Scarborough Hospital. She holds the Kwok Yuan and Betty Ho Chair in Integrative Medicine at the University of Toronto and is a scientist in the Department of Psychosocial Oncology and Palliative Care at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. And for the past 20 years, Dr. Balnes has focused her research on supporting informed treatment decisions for people interested in using complementary therapies. Since 2007, Dr. Balnes has been the principal investigator of the Complementary Medicine Education and Outcomes, otherwise known as CAMEO, research program. And CAMEO has developed and evaluated a variety of education and decision support interventions aimed at helping cancer patients and health professionals make evidence-based decisions about complementary th therapies. So I'll now turn the mic over to Dr. Balnese. Welcome. Great. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, and good afternoon, everyone, uh, wherever you are across Canada or beyond. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be invited by Lymphoma Canada to do this presentation today, which is really going to focus on how you, as an individual living with lymphoma or perhaps supporting someone living with lymphoma, can make wise safe and informed decisions around complementary therapies. There's many different therapies out there and there's, there's no way today that I can go through all the different therapies that people are interested in, but I am going to touch on some of the more popular ones uh, and am more than happy to try and answer the questions you may have about other ones later on. I'm not able to give uh, specific medical advice today because uh, it's too difficult over the web to do that without knowing your background and your interests and your beliefs, uh, but I'm happy to answer generic questions you may have or point you in the right direction in terms of where you can get uh, good evidence around various therapies. So let's begin. So I'm going to start by putting us all on the same page in terms of what is complementary and alternative medicine. And I use the definition from the NIH, the National Institutes of Health of the United States, their National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, to find CAM as a group of diverse medical and healthcare systems, practices, and products that are not presently considered to be part of conventional medicine. Now, this has been a real moving target because, as was mentioned, I've done research in this field for about 20 years. And 20 years ago, things like acupuncture or meditation were considered quite out there and not part of conventional care. We now see those sorts of therapies being embedded in part of many conventional cancer centers around the world. And we also are starting to see more and more research on things like natural health products, things like yoga or uh, uh, the, the mind-body therapies are now being actually embedded as part of many standard care programs around the world. When I talk about complementary and alternative medicine and cancer care, we usually immediately start thinking about the natural health products, which are vitamins, minerals, nutraceuticals, other biological agents. But there's many more therapies that exist under this general rubric of complementary medicine. The body-based ones, I mentioned yoga, it also could be something like Tai Chi, or maybe starting an exercise program, or going for a massage. We also have the mind-body therapies. Meditation is very popular right now with a lot of research supporting its, its safe and effective nature. Uh, but we also see other mind-body therapies like art and music therapy slowly making their way into cancer programs. The energy therapies, I mentioned acupuncture as being one example of that, but we also see people engaging in things like Reiki and Qigong 
often trying to address some of the energy deficits you may have living with cancer or undergoing conventional cancer treatments, or trying to perhaps address symptoms like pain or perhaps things like chemo brain in terms of helping them uh, with the energy flow within their body. And the last group is the whole systems, and that's where it's really important that we acknowledge that allopathic conventional medicine is just one form of medicine, where we have other forms of medicine that have existed for hundreds if not thousands of years, and that includes things like traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, or things like naturopathic medicine. In terms of terminology today, I, I, I often will shift between different terms, but I tend to use complementary medicine because that's where we use these therapies alongside our conventional care. And that's what the majority of people living with cancer tend to do. Only about 4 to 5 percent actually move themselves towards an alternative medicine where they may make decisions to not use a conventional treatment and in its place they may choose to use uh, a form of complementary medicine. But as I said, very few people tend to do that. And what we're really moving towards now in this field is this idea of integration and integrative medicine, where we're combining safe and evidence-based therapies from complementary medicine within the realm of conventional care. And this is really about having comprehensive medicine that's really patient-centered, where we're pulling the best from all worlds. Now, I'm really focusing today on talking about how to make informed decisions, and to me this really goes back to this issue of communicating and communication around complementary medicine. And the statistics that really drove my work towards trying to, to develop uh, decision support interventions was the fact that up to 60% of people living with cancer are not informing their conventional healthcare providers about what they're using. And when speaking to patients, they've kind of shared a variety of reasons. You know, one is some patients said, I'm kind of embarrassed to be talking about all these different therapists and therapies that I'm using and really worried that my physician or my other care provider is not going to understand why I've made these choices and might actually be angry with me and might, it might influence our relationship if they find out about this therapy use. They've also shared that some professionals have said it's not really useful, I'm not really interested in talking about it, and they didn't seem very interested in having a dialogue about it. And lastly, some patients have said, you know, I don't see the relevance. I might be using something like chiropractic medicine for a car accident that I have, and why would it be relevant? you know, to my cancer care provider. And, and this really has raised some concerns about how informed are patients' decisions around complementary medicine? Are they getting good evidence in making these decisions? And are they also engaging in a dialogue with their healthcare providers to ensure that the care they receive from their conventional provider isn't going to interact negatively with the other therapies that they're using? So that really kind of pushed me to develop interventions that would help people talk about these therapies and make sure that they're getting good information about them. So to start off, I'm going to kind of touch on some of the top questions you should be asking when you're making decisions about complementary medicine. And hopefully some of these will resonate with those of you that have already made decisions about using these treatments. To start, I think it's so important that before you start going down the realm of trying a lot of different natural health products or going to a lot of different practitioners, it's important that you just think about your foundation in general around your overall health. We are seeing more and more research in the field of cancer to suggest that diet and exercise are very, very key to our overall well-being, how we manage uh, conventional treatments, and also for some conditions, whether we see a reoccurrence in disease. So I really encourage you to, to maybe go talk to a dietitian at your cancer center about your diet and how you can make healthy choices, pulling a lot from the vegetables and fruits. If you're eating a lot of grains, make sure they're whole grains. And we're seeing more evidence, most recently around processed meats, that we really need to be limiting our, our use of red meats, processed meats, and maybe turn towards more things like seafood or other protein sources like soya or, or beans or nuts uh, in terms of having a balanced diet. And in terms of exercise, which can be very difficult to do while you're under conventional treatment, we are seeing that trying to maintain at least 20 minutes of light exercise where you work out and get a bit of a sweat going can be very helpful in terms of your overall well-being and also in terms of preventing reoccurrence of certain cancers. Stress management and sleep is becoming much more relevant and we're starting to realize that the stress hormones and not getting enough sleep can really shift things within our bodies and perhaps make it more difficult to handle conventional treatments as well as preventing reoccurrence. So I encourage you to perhaps speak to a counselor or to speak to your family physician in terms of how you can manage some of these, these issues. 
And then lastly, limiting your exposure to tobacco as well as to sun exposure is important just for overall health and well-being. Now secondly, again, before you jump into using complementary medicine, I think it's so important to think about why are you using these therapies. And for some people, it is about curing cancer or preventing a reoccurrence of disease. But for many other individuals, they're using these therapies to really help them in managing their conventional treatment and address some of the side effects that they may be experiencing, like pain, maybe anxiety, maybe you're struggling with, with chemo brain. So some of, of the different therapies that exist in the realm of complementary medicine may be helpful. Some people, too, are just using this as a pivotal moment in their life to look at their overall well-being and try to find a more healthy, uh, healthy course. Uh, and lastly, we talked about anxiety. Other people may have a lot of distress and some depression attached to undergoing cancer treatment. And so some therapies may help you in coping with those aspects. I also think that for many of you, you may have been using these therapies before your cancer diagnosis. And so it's not surprising that you may turn to the home when you're looking at all the different therapies that may help you. And think about what your priorities are. You know, we often talk about having a good quality of life and making sure that you're not making decisions that are negatively in fact, uh, impacting you not only physically, but emotionally, spiritually, financially, and in your relationships. And so really reflect on what's important to you, what you believe about your health and well-being, and make decisions around complementary therapies that really match those values. Number, third, number three. When you're moving into this realm of, of complementary medicine decision making, it's so important to think about evidence. You know, we often say that there's not a lot of evidence. You know, a lot of my colleagues think there's not a lot of evidence around these therapies, but there actually has been a growing body of research around everything from natural health products to mind body into some of the energy therapies. And when we talk about evidence, it's really the top of this pyramid where we're looking for human trials that are randomized and blinded where possible, uh, or systematic reviews or meta-analyses where they pull together all the different clinical trials that have been done on a therapy, and we're able to kind of have big data to be able to say, are these therapies safe, and do they work? A lot of research, particularly around natural health products, is still at the bottom of this pyramid. It's on mice models, it's in a test tube, or in a petri dish. That is very valuable evidence, but it doesn't necessarily tell us if these therapies are going to be safe and will work in our actual human body. So I really encourage you, if you're looking up some of this research, and I'll point you to some, some websites that will help you find this evidence, that you're really looking for human trials with people that are living with lymphoma. And if you're interested in some of the clinical trials that might be ongoing right now that we don't have their evidence quite yet, you can go to the website clinicaltrials.gov and type in lymphoma as well as complementary therapies and it will pull up trials that are currently recruiting patients across North America. So I mentioned where do you get this credible uh, evidence and I really encourage people to avoid just going onto Google and typing in complementary medicine because you'll end up with over 13 million hits and that's really hard to sift through to find what is actually reliable and credible information. If you're going to use Google, I suggest you type in Google Scholar and that will actually take you to the Google database that is based on peer-reviewed uh, journals and that is the best source of information if you're using Google as a search engine. What I'd really recommend is that you search out some of the specific institutes that are very credible and evidence-based uh, that are focused in the area of complementary medicine. And the number one uh, center is the NIH Center, the National Center for Complementary Integrative Health. Or if you're interested in one specific to cancer, the National Cancer Institute in the United States has the Office of Cancer and Complementary and Alternative Medicine. Another source, which is an international resource, and it has monographs on specific therapies specific to cancer, is the CAM and Cancer uh, uh, database. And that's put together by NAFCAM, which is their National Center for CAM Research in Norway. And I've been part of that. They have an international uh, jury that reviews the information and pulls together these monographs. And lastly, if you uh, have a bit of a science background or you've got used to reading uh, scientific articles, you can search through PubMed and they have a specific search engine specific to CAM that you can actually look in and it will pull up all research around complementary medicine and your type of disease. Now, natural health products are definitely uh, therapies that people are very interested in when they're diagnosed with cancers like lymphoma. And there's some really great databases that are based on their most recent research that can really tell you, are they safe? What have they been used for? What type of dose? 
dosages have been used, and can they potentially interact with any other medication that you may be on or any other health conditions that you may be living with. The one that I often turn to right away is the Memorial Sloan Kettering Herbs and Botanical Database, and it's a great resource. It has monographs that are suitable for your doctor that you can print off for health professionals, but they also have one for the general public that has a little bit easier language to understand. They also now have a, an app that you can get on your smartphone and actually be able to look up these therapies if you're sitting in a waiting room or if you want to show it to a friend or to your healthcare provider. Uh, and you can find that through their website. Another resource, for some of you, you may have been in your doctor's office and noticed the big blue book called the CPS, which has all the pharmaceutical drugs listed. Something that is very similar in the world of natural health products is natural medicines, which basically is a compendium of all the natural health products that are out there. You can type in a generic or a specific brand name, and it will pull up information about what therapies, uh, what type of research has been done, is it safe, what are some of the side effects of that therapy, and also all the interaction information. So it's a great resource. There is a slight cost to it, but if you're starting to do research in this area, you could pay for one month or you could go to your cancer agency and ask the librarian if they have access. Many cancer agencies across the country do have access and the librarians can help you look up certain monographs. It's also important to note in Canada that our natural health products are regulated by Health Canada and if you're interested in knowing specifically whether a, a therapy that you're using is regulated in Canada, you can go to the Natural Non-Prescription Health Product Directorate and look up that information and pull off a brand specific monograph that has been submitted by that producer. If you're interested in vitamins and minerals and knowing what levels are safe and what they could be used for, the NIH Office of Dietary Supplements is a great resource, particularly around vitamins and minerals. Now, those are a lot of different websites. There's a lot more out there. And if you're interested in finding links to them, you can go to the cameoprogram.org, which is our research program that was mentioned at the beginning of this program, and go to useful links. And you can find links to those websites that I just mentioned and some other ones as well. What are the side effects? This is another really important question to ask around using any form of complementary medicine. And the same like using any type of pharmaceutical drug or undergoing any other treatment in the conventional world, everything has side effects. If it's positively influencing our body, there's always a possibility that it could potentially have a negative effect. And so think about all the different camp therapies you're using for, not just for your lymphoma, but for perhaps other conditions, and just be aware of what the potential side effects are. So if they occur, you're able to know that that could be related to your CAM use. Around natural health products, the side effects that we need to be thinking about, hormonal activity is usually quite important if you're living with a prostate or a breast cancer, not as relevant for someone that perhaps is living with lymphoma. One issue that is very important, and I find many natural health products have this side effect, is they affect our blood, and they affect, in particular, whether our blood clots the same way or not. So things like garlic, willow bark, or feverfew actually can cause bleeding. And if you're taking other medications that can also cause bleeding, you could see bruising, bleeding gums, and if you're undergoing something like a surgery, you need to be talking to your surgeon about what therapies you're using because you may need to stop before your surgery so they don't have any uh, negative effects. Some um, natural health products affect our kidneys, affect our liver, so if you're using a therapy that you know could affect that functioning of that organ, you might want to be asking for blood tests that monitor that to make sure that you're not having any negative effect. You need to remember that chemotherapy works through our kidneys and our liver, and they can be quite taxing, taxing to it. So if you're taking a whole bunch of natural health products that are also being processed by that, that route, you need to be careful you're not overburdening uh, your kidneys or your liver. Now another really important issue is that certain natural health products can affect how drugs are metabolized and broken down in our bodies. So something like St. John's wort that many people use for, for mood issues or for anxiety or distress, it can actually cause many medications to go out of our body too quickly. So if you're wanting to, if you're taking chemotherapy or other conventional medications that are supposed to be in your body for a certain period of time, you don't want to be taking a natural health product that's going to clear it too soon. So talking to a pharmacist can be a great resource in figuring out whether there's any negative interactions that you need to be careful of. Other things to be aware of is that, you know, you could see a change in your blood values. So if you're having blood tests being taken as part of your lymphoma uh, care, make sure you're telling them of any natural health products that you could be using. 
And if you tend to have allergic reactions to things like hay fever, you know, ragweed, you may be allergic to some of the herbs that you could be taking. And some people experience a lot of GI disturbances if they're having a bit of a reaction, so diarrhea, vomiting, and nausea. If you're already experiencing that as part of your treatment, you might want to be careful about adding natural health products that could be contributing to that. And be aware if you're living with heart disease, diabetes, be careful that your natural health product isn't affecting your medication around those, treat, those, those conditions, um, or it could be shifting your condition, uh, either positively or negatively. So just to be aware of that. Oops, I went a little too far. The other thing to be really thinking about, and I think I went, sorry about that. So another important question is when is the right time to use complementary medicine? And a lot of that relates back to this issue of side effects. And so we have a lot of patients say, is it safe to use these therapies while I'm undergoing active treatment? The difficulty in our field is that we don't have a lot of research that is looking at people on active chemotherapy, radiation, or undergoing surgery and using complementary medicine at the same time. We typically do this research when people have finished their treatment. So because we have a lot of unknowns, we often tell people to perhaps think about stopping complementary medicine or holding off on it until they finish their active treatment. I also have seen people have a conversation with their oncologist or their physician and talk about how they can perhaps have a bit of a washout period. So they can use maybe a natural health product for a certain period of time and then stop them a week before they begin their chemo. So there's a washout period and then restart after the chemotherapy has cleared their body. So that's a conversation you may want to have with your oncologist or your pharmacist about that. We see a lot of people, though, when they finish treatment, they feel there's a bit of a gap in care. And so that's really a time when they want to get active in looking after themselves and perhaps still engage in some form of health care. And so we see people begin to use a lot of complementary medicine at that point. Sadly, there are some people that do experience a reoccurrence. And this might be a time, reflecting on how conventional treatment was for you, to think about adding complementary medicine to help you in managing any future treatments you may be undergoing. And as I've mentioned, you know, be careful of interactions, but also be aware that you know, there's some periods during your cancer journey where you may have very low energy. And using complementary medicine, you know, making a new diet, seeing a lot of practitioners can be very time intensive and energy draining. So make sure that you're maintaining a balance as you go through your cancer journey. The other thing to think about is this, this notion of quality of life. And as I just mentioned, you know, you need to be thinking about your physical and emotional well-being as you're going through your cancer journey and whether you're using complementary medicine is promoting it or could it be uh, adding some stress to your life that you may not need at this time. I think you also need to think that, you know, for many people using complementary medicine is a way for them to regain control over their health. Cancer and cancer treatment can feel very uncontrollable at times and, you know, changing your diet, going to a yoga class is some way of feeling like you're doing something for yourself and having some control over that. It may also be that you have some strong beliefs about what caused your cancer, what will make you feel better, and it's important that you're able to address those and complementary medicine may be one way of doing that. You know, as I mentioned, it's not just the physical effects of CAM you need to be thinking about. Many of these therapies and therapists can be quite expensive. You may have some coverage through uh, third-party insurance if you're fortunate enough to have that. Uh, and if not, you need to be balancing, you know, the financial costs with the benefits that you're getting from these therapies. Think about your time and energy, and also think about your family. Uh, we've seen some families where there's a great deal of conflict around using complementary medicine. They're either pro or against the use. You know, sitting down and having a conversation with your family about your reasons for wanting to use complementary medicine and hearing their side of it and how they can support you, you know, is a way to kind of uh, forego some of those conflicts that can develop. Who should I talk to about complementary medicine? You know, I think it's essential that you share your CAM use with all of your healthcare providers and share all your conventional uh, care plans with all of your providers so that we don't have, you know, a naturopath not knowing what you're doing and we don't have your, your oncologist not knowing what you're doing. You know, in order to provide safe and comprehensive care that truly understands your care plan, everyone needs to be aware of everything that you're doing. So, you know, talk to your radiation and medical oncologists. 
Some of them may not be interested in hearing about it. What I often tell patients is maybe come in with the monographs of the therapies that you're using and say, these are therapies I'm using. Do you have any concerns? Is there anyone here in the agency that you'd like me to speak to about using these therapies? And could you put these monographs in my chart so that other practitioners are aware that I'm using these therapies? You may also find that this type of care and coordination might be better suited in your primary care setting, so talking to your family physician or a nurse practitioner. And you may also find reaching out to dietitians, pharmacists, or other allied health professionals in the cancer setting to get their advice or to get perhaps uh, appropriate referrals to other evidence-based sources that they may have may be helpful. Uh, and in terms of CAM providers, there's many out there. We often encourage people to go towards those that are regulated uh, within your province, and that usually includes people like naturopaths, TCM uh, doctors, acupuncturists, as well as chiropractors. When you're trying to make decisions around using these different therapies uh, and you're really coming to that decision-making point, I usually tell people to really think about uh, does it work? And that goes back to what are your goals? And is there evidence that you're actually going to be able to achieve your goal in using that therapy? Do be aware of conflict of interest. There's conflict of interest across both conventional and complementary medicine. Uh, and for individuals that are selling natural health products as part of their practice, I often will encourage patients to ask, are you selling these at cost? Or is there a profit being made here? And it's just being a, an informed consumer and asking those types of questions. You know, the safety to me is paramount. Are there risks? Do those risks uh, outweigh the possible benefits? And really, again, I can't emphasize enough this idea of interaction. Do you know of any interactions? If you were having an interaction, what would it look like? And what's the plan? You know, I see some patients that say, I've been told to use these therapies, and I'm going to be using them indefinitely. Or should there be outcomes that are seen within a certain period of time? How long am I going to use these therapies before we revisit that decision and maybe see if there's something else that I could be using? And who will be monitoring my CAM use? Is it going to be my practitioner? Will I be responsible for that? Or can I work with my care provider in the conventional setting to help me in doing some of the blood tests and monitoring for any side effects I could be experiencing? And I've talked already about affording the time, the money, and the effort to make sure that you have a balanced approach. I get a lot of people asking me, you know, who should I see? If I'm interested in a naturopath, who would you recommend? It's, it's very difficult, you know, to provide those type of recommendations unless you're working closely with an individual. And I really do encourage people to think about uh, the type of training. And if you're interested in knowing more about how different practitioners in the CAM world are trained, you can go to camline.ca and look up some of that information. What I usually encourage people to do is think about choosing an individual who's part of a professional association or a regulatory body or college where that college will have uh, information about whether that person has any complaints against them, are they regulated, have they undergone the proper educational training, and if there are any concerns about individuals, they should be registered with that college. I also will be asking patients to really think about what claims are being made by their practitioner, and if they're making claims about being able to address a symptom or a condition, what type of evidence are they using to back that up? I've mentioned conflict of interest. Also, you need to balance the financial cost of using a CAM provider, so asking your insurer whether there's any coverage for that. Some clinics can offer a sliding scale for people that are low income, so in making inquiries about that, and understanding if you're following a protocol, how much will that overall protocol cost you in the future? And me, for me, really key is will that practitioner be willing to work with your other care providers? They may not always find a receptive audience on the other side, but being willing to write a letter that summarizes your treatment plan and being able to take that letter to your oncologist and again placing that on the chart, make sure that everyone is on the same page in terms of what you're receiving. And hopefully you can also have that correspondence going back to your CAM provider as well. There are some warning signs, I find, in terms of natural uh, um, health practitioners or complementary medicine practitioners that are just some alarm bells that should make you ask maybe some more questions. You know, one, if they're charging thousands and thousands of dollars and are very, very expensive, you want to make sure that you're not in a vulnerable state and are perhaps being taken advantage of. Because we have seen that happen, unfortunately, uh, over the past few years. You know. Making a claim that they can cure your lymphoma, cure your cancer, that's a claim that no practitioner in any realm should be making. 
Uh, and so if those claims are being made, I would be very cautious. If they're not able to provide any evidence of effectiveness, and may, it may not be a journal article, but if they're not able to perhaps share some of the experiential evidence that they have or historical evidence, I would be, be concerned. If someone says to stop all of your conventional medication because it's going to inter uh, negatively interact with their treatment plan, that's a concern. We're really moving towards this idea of integration, and any recommendation to stop all medication uh, should be quite concerning. And I've mentioned this idea of having a clear treatment plan. They should be able to tell you what you'll be doing, how long you should be doing it, and what are the goals. How will I monitor my CAM use? Uh, this can be difficult because not all CAM providers uh, are able to do blood tests. They may be asking you to ask your practitioner, your, your doctor, to do the blood test for them. And often it does fall on you as the consumer to be keeping track of how you're doing. I do suggest you consider a CAM diary, and we have an example on the cameoprogram.org website if you want to download that. And it just helps you keep track of what you're using, what are your goals and outcomes that you're hoping it will achieve, and also are you experiencing any side effects? You know, I'm brushing my teeth and I'm noticing that there's now blood in the sink. Could I be having some bleeding problems? And it's just a way of keeping it forefront in your mind of everything you should be thinking about and, and if you're actually achieving the outcomes that you need. There's also this idea of, you know, monitoring it physiologically. So are there blood tests you could be taking? You know, can you time some of your CT scans or MRIs you know, while you're receiving treatments around CAM and be able to see if you have disease progression or not? There might be some other tests too that can help you uh, in, in monitoring the effects of, of certain CAM therapies and your CAM provider should help you in, in understanding what those are. One thing I do really suggest if you're beginning natural health product use or you're adding a whole bunch of new uh, CAM uh, therapies is try to add them one at a time. If you add a whole cohort at, at, at all at once and you have a negative reaction, you may not know which therapy is causing that. So starting one therapy um, every day or talking to your CAM provider about how to do that in a graduated manner might be very helpful. I also suggest that you keep revisiting your CAM decisions. Um, and that, you know, as you move through your cancer journey, you may need to have new goals developed. Uh, your needs may change. And research on complementary medicine is constantly changing as well. So keep going back every three to six months to see if there's any new evidence that you need to consider in making your decision. And again, making sure that you're constantly uh, making uh, choices that are healthy and are balanced. Now I'm going to quickly go through some of the therapies that you may have heard about or may be interested in using. The first one I want to talk about is mindfulness-based stress reduction, or MBSR. This is really a, a, a protocol that has become embedded in many conventional care settings. It's a combination of meditation with hatha yoga breathing, and it's often offered in a very structured way over eight weeks with some homework, with an educational component. And clinical trials have really shown that it's helped people in their emotional and psychological well-being, sleep quality as well, reduction in stress, improvement in mood, and what's really interesting is in the last year or so, we're starting to see its impact on the body, including such things as lengthening our telomeres on our DNA, which has been linked to longevity, as well as managing some of our stress hormones. So this is a therapy that I would encourage if you're experiencing any stress or anxiety, is really a therapy that you should consider uh, embedding as part of your care. Another one that has gained a lot of clinical trial uh, data in the last few years is acupuncture. Being uh, acupuncture can be with needles, it can be with pressure points, it can be with heat, and it's applied in certain points in our body to help improve flow in our body. Physiologically, we're starting to understand that it has a role in releasing certain, certain neurotransmitters, it affects the pituitary gland and certain hormones that are being released, and also fMRI studies have shown it changes how our brain functions. We've seen positive trials around managing nausea and vomiting for people that may be finding the antiemetic meds are not working. We also know that it can help people with some forms of cancer pain. But we do need some further trials because some of those trials weren't quite as well designed. We're also just starting to see beginning evidence that it may help people in managing fatigue as well as peripheral neuropathy in the hands and feet. So this may be a therapy you can try if you're finding that conventional treatment is not effective. 
Now, for those of you that are experiencing nausea and vomiting and are finding that the drugs are not quite helping you enough, ginger is actually a, a natural health product that we have found in clinical trials to be helpful when it's added alongside the antiemetic drugs. Uh, it is a, an antiplatelet, so it means it can cause bleeding and bruising if it's used in large amounts. And also for anyone with diabetes, it can affect your blood sugar level. It's usually recommended that people are shaving about one gram of ginger into hot water. Some people add honey to that, uh, and they drink it as a tea. But this is something that you should maybe speak to a, a natural health provider to ensure that you're getting uh, the proper dosage. Now, curcumin is a therapy, a natural health product that's been used for many years, particularly within Ayurvedic medicine. And there's been a lot of interest in it in terms of its role in preventing the growth of certain cancer cells. We have a lot of lab data that suggests that it could be effective. Um, and we've also started to see that it could actually work together with some chemotherapy and radiation treatments uh, and actually promote uh, anti-tumor anti effects. And particularly, it's been in pancreatic and colorectal cancer. Sadly, we haven't had any research on lymphoma at this time, um, and we've also seen some research that it may actually inhibit certain chemotherapy agents, uh, particularly in relation to breast cancer. So it's very important with something like curcumin that you talk again to a pharmacist or to a natural healthcare provider to ask about any potential interactions if you're undergoing chemo treatment at this time. It's also part of the ginger fa uh, family, so it also has this anti-clotting effect so be cautious if you do have any uh, bleeding issues to be concerned about. Now, I have to talk about cannabis. Uh, it's not considered a natural health product because it is still a controlled substance right now in Canada, but uh, it now sounds like that will be shifting in the next uh, couple of years. Um, cannabis is composed of several different components. THC is one active component. That's what gives uh, individuals that, uh, that, that high that people experience with cannabis. But it also has uh, cannabinoids. CBD1 and 2 in particular are uh, components that may have a role in uh, not only managing the symptoms of cancer treatment, but may actually have a role in, in cancer growth itself. We do know that uh, in looking at trials of herbal cannabis, as well as looking at pharmaceutical forms of cannabis, it can help people with pain, nausea and vomiting, and also with certain types of seizure disorders. Uh, we are still doing research to tell us whether it has a role in preventing the spread of cancer. And I know a lot of people are interested in using cannabis oil to this effect. We really only have beginning evidence, particularly around brain tumors, about its potential role. Um, and we have some lab studies suggest it may have a role in managing certain lymphoma cells. Uh, but at this time, we haven't quite got the human trials underway. If you do use cannabis, you should be speaking to a health professional about that. It has a great deal of, of side effects, including potentially the psychoactive high. Uh, some people actually do experience paranoia in using cannabis. And if you have any mental health issues or under the age of 25, there's been a great deal of concern about it making mental health, particularly depression and anxiety, worse. And so cannabis is not for everyone, and it should be used with caution. Now, IV vitamin C is, uh, again, another therapy that we see a lot of interest in by, by uh, cancer patients, including those living with lymphoma. We also know it's often uh, promoted within uh, the naturopathic community. Uh, it's really coming back to this idea that uh, IV vitamin C allows you to get high, high levels of vitamin C in your body, which has been shown to perhaps have a role in preventing malignant uh, infiltration, which means preventing cancer cells from spreading through the body. Uh, we know that vitamin C is important also for things like wound healing and for cellular growth uh, around wound healing. We don't, again, have a lot of clinical trials of whether IV vitamin C is effective as a cancer treatment. There have been studies with humans to show that most people are able to tolerate tolerate the high dosages of vitamin C, and some people may have uh, a bit of stomach upset when they're taking such large dosages. We have some small studies that suggest it can help people's symptom management and their quality of life, uh, and we just had some very beginning research suggest it could prevent inflammation in certain individuals. Whether it has a negative impact on how chemotherapy and radiation works in the body, we don't know that yet because many of these cancer patients were already past their conventional treatment. And so when you're using a high-dose antioxidant, you have to be careful that it's not 
negatively uh, preventing the chemotherapy from having the same oxidative effect and killing cancer cells in your body. So this is really, again, a conversation with a pharmacist or with a physician that you should have before using this therapy. So to, to wrap up, uh, I really want to emphasize that we're really at the beginning stage of doing research in complementary medicine. And you know, just because we don't have a clinical trial yet on a therapy doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means we don't have that knowledge yet. And we may not know whether it's safe or not to be using as an individual living with cancer. And it's important to stay up to date because this is a field that is rapidly changing. And so getting on to listservs, so you're getting the most recent updates, uh, checking in uh, on the research that's taking place is going to be really important as you move through your journey. I really encourage you to have this dialogue with your oncologist, with your primary care provider, and letting them know everything that you're using why you're wanting to use it, and whether you can gain their help in monitoring you uh, and seeing what the outcomes are and the side effects. I really think that we're seeing a shift in the conventional system where there's more openness to talk about these therapies, and there's more acceptance that some of these therapies can actually be beneficial. You know, just like conventional treatment, there are pros and cons to using every different type of therapy. And just ensure that the pros are outweighing the cons. And make sure that it's not having a negative impact on yourself and your quality of life, as well as those that are closest to you. And again, diet and exercise. You know, I often jokingly say to people, you know, before you spend hundreds of dollars on natural health products or going to CAM providers, make sure that you're eating a healthy diet and you're getting your exercise, because that will probably be something that Will recommend to you to do anyways and it's a way for you to get that beginning um, that beginning a sense of well-being and control over your disease so that's it for me uh, I really we have about 15 minutes left I'm excited to hear if you have any questions or comments uh, that I'd be able to address and if you have questions that you'd like to send to me privately feel free to reach me at my U of Toronto.ca address thank you Thank you so much, Dr. Balneves. That was a really informative, uh, great overview of CAM therapies and um, gave us a great idea of all the things we need to consider when choosing and using complementary therapies, both during and after uh, cancer treatments. Um, there are a couple of questions from the audience. If you'd like to ask Dr. Balneves a question, you can uh, type it into the question box in your, uh, on your dashboard and we'll get to as many as we can. Also, just a reminder that uh, we did record the webinar, and it will be posted on Lymphoma Canada's website shortly. And a handout of the slides is also available. Uh, you'll see it in the toolbar that you can download and print if you wish. So one of the first questions is about lymphatic massage therapy. Um, I guess, what is the purpose, and when can it be used? Uh, so is that a question on lymphatic uh, manual drainage in terms of the massage technique? Uh, I believe so, yeah. So uh, we typically see um, lymphatic drainage being used when someone has had surgery uh, and now has impaired flow of lymph uh, to their limbs, so often in the arm or to the leg. Uh, usually you see a massage therapist or physiotherapist that have the specific training in that technique. Uh, and so if you're living with lymphoma and have had uh, no dissections and have found that you now have a swelling in the arms, um, it may be appropriate to see an individual and have a consult about uh, how useful uh, manual lymph drainage may be, whether you're going to do that alone or perhaps with compression bandaging, which some people uh, do undertake alongside manual lymph drainage, uh, to see if you can have improved flow. Uh, in terms of the timing of an, uh, lymphatic drainage, that's not something that actually I'm aware of in terms of the context of lymphoma treatment. Uh, you obviously, uh, it, it's quite an intensive uh, technique. Uh, if you're undergoing a chemotherapy agent that could be affecting your clotting and you're finding yourself bruising, you may be wanting to hold off on receiving manual lymph drainage uh, until uh, you're not having that same type of clotting issue. So otherwise you may end up with a great deal of bruising uh, as you're doing the manual lymph drainage. Um, uh, and you might want to consult with your massage therapist or physiotherapist about whether there's any concerns, any other concerns about doing that treatment, particularly if you're 
have recently experienced surgery, if you have any drains attached, they usually will hold off on doing any type of massage techniques uh, until those drains and those surgery sites are completely healed. Um, so consulting with those uh, experts in that is probably the, the best time, the best way to kind of gain uh, advice about the timing of manual lymph drainage. You know, the one issue with it is that you often have to continue to use it over the course of your lifetime. Uh, it's not something that necessarily resolves. It's more for symptom management. I have heard of some individuals that have uh, received training in order to do manual lymph drainage themselves or to perhaps have a family member or a close friend uh, assist them in that, particularly if you're living in a rural or remote region and may not have access to those individuals on a, on a regular basis. Great, thanks. Um, another question. Someone wants to know if there are any differences between indolent and aggressive lymphomas with respect to CAM therapies. I assume whether or not there are certain CAM therapies that help with one or the other mm -hmm. specifically. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. And um, unfortunately, before uh, I prepared for this, uh, this slideshow, I uh, went through the literature to see if we had any research on specifically lymphoma. And we only have had about one or two trials that have focused on things like uh, mindfulness uh, or focused on yoga therapies. We really haven't seen any complementary medicine therapies like natural health products being uh, tested in lymphoma patients. So in terms of whether one therapy is going to be more effective than another, uh, based on the type of lymphoma you have, really have no evidence to support that one way or the other. I guess the thing to think about is if you're living with a more aggressive disease uh, that you know, may not have um, the same type of prognosis as one that's more chronic, um, it will shift how you make your decisions. So you may be willing to accept a bit more risk in using certain complementary medicines or be willing to live with some uncertainty if we don't have a lot of research on them uh, versus someone that has a chronic disease that's being well maintained uh, through conventional care. So it may shift your priority setting and your level of your comfort level around risk and uncertainty uh, based on the type of lymphoma that you have. But uh, unfortunately we need a lot more research to be able to tell whether a certain therapy may have uh, a certain role uh, based on the type. That makes sense. Um, and another audience member wants to know what your thoughts are on wheatgrass. Wheatgrass. So uh, I get those que that question about wheatgrass every once in a while. It's not a therapy uh, that has had any clinical trials that I've been able to track down in the last couple of years, and it's not a therapy I looked up for today's presentation, so I could be uh, I could be wrong. Um, encourage you to go to something like Morris Long Kettering to see if they have anything new on wheatgrass. Um, it's it's often uh, promoted as being a, a source of of, um, of fiber, but also a source of antioxidants. Um, you know, the jury is still out on many uh, antioxidants, particularly if you're using them at very, very high dosages. Uh, there's been a concern for many years that certain chemotherapy agents and radiation treatment, uh, it creates an oxidative stress in the body, which uh, then creates these free radicals that then go and kill more cancer cells. And antioxidants work by coming in and actually glomming on to those free radicals and preventing them from killing more cells, including cancer cells. So there's been some concern about using high, high dosages while you're undergoing conventional treatment. Um, we know antioxidants uh, are important for overall well-being. It just may be that if you're using wheatgrass in very uh, high amounts that you may want to hold off if you're undergoing uh, active conventional treatment. Um, you know, the other thing is, is it something that you actually enjoy taking? I know often people add it as part of um, not always a capsule. It could be part of a smoothie or in a drink or juice form. Um, if it's something that you enjoy, that's great. And if not, there may be other antioxidants, uh, especially things like using uh, blueberries uh, that are very high in antioxidants. It might be a, a better choice because not everyone likes, likes wheatgrass. And do you have any advice about uh, using Reiki, aromatherapy, and therapeutic touch for cancer? Yeah. Survival? So, you know, Reiki has really been one of those therapies that, uh, I'll be honest, I've tried to talk to some physicians about it, and they start backing away from me because it's about an energy therapy that I don't think conventional medicine really understands yet. Uh, to me, uh, Reiki, therapeutic touch, and aromatherapy are all supportive therapies that if they fit with your belief system, if you have a belief um, that you know, you're having a disruption in your energy flow, if you're looking for something that can help you in coping with 
anxiety, distress, and fatigue, those are therapies that you can safely add on. They have, they're often without touch or the therapeutic touch can, you know, be light touch, so can Reiki. Uh, we haven't seen any studies that suggest it has a negative effect. Aromatherapy, some people can be very sensitive to scents. Obviously, it should not be consumed internally. Uh, if you're sensitive, undergoing treatments, you know, having some nausea related to scents, you may want to hold off on aromatherapy. In terms of, of Reiki, we are just starting to see the clinical trials being conducted on Reiki, uh, and what we've seen is an improvement in people's quality of life, and we're starting to see that it has a potential role in improving fatigue. Uh, so again, those are therapies that you can add on at any time during your journey, and they may actually be beneficial for some individuals, particularly around psychological and energy levels. And we have a question about uh, diet, uh, seafood allergy in particular, and this person wants to know if there are any dietary alternatives to seafood that might offer the same um, nutritional uh, value, I guess. Yeah, um, you know, often we're seeing the seafood, uh, you know, being added to the diet as people are trying to move away from using red red meats or processed meats. Um, you know, I, there are uh, other forms of protein. Uh, chicken uh, can be a better source. Again, if you can afford and have access to organic uh, poultry, that's that's one of the better choices. There's a lot of people that will move more into the vegan, vegetarian choices of protein. So perhaps adding more legumes and beans to your diet. Uh, you may also find, uh, I happen to really like tofu, um, and so there's a lot of different forms of soy products. Tofu is one of them uh, that you can add to your diet, uh, add to stir fries, you know, add, uh, you know, to soups uh, to increase the protein that you may be missing. There are some individuals that are also consuming uh, many ocean-based fish because they're trying to also up their omega-3s and 6s. Um, if that's the case, then you can uh, perhaps consult a, a, a practitioner around perhaps adding uh, an omega-3 or 6 supplement. Again, it's often something that affects our clotting factors, so making sure if you're using other natural health products that have that effect, that you're putting those all together and make sure you're not having a, a synergistic effect there. But uh, you might have to do the supplements if your aim is to get the, the omegas uh, levels up in your body. Great. And another audience member wants to know um, about, I guess, her, uh, an organization requires a note from her oncologist to enable her to have reflexology treatment. And she wants to know whether this is an issue, I guess, of safety or specific, something specifically related to her treatments, um, whether, why she needs, I guess, permission. Um. That, that's a surprise to me because uh, reflexology is, um, it's not a regulated health profession uh, in our province. It's not often covered through uh, any third party insurers. Um, I'm not sure if it's just due diligence on the part of the re reflexologist to ensure that the oncologist is aware of the reflexology treatments being done. Reflexology believes that in, in uh, stimulating and putting applying pressure on the foot that certain organs in the body will be stimulated and they may, from their theoretical base, have a concern about overstimulation or understimulation and its impact on cancer treatments or cancer outcomes. Um, we don't have any research to back that up one way or the other. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not quite sure why they're, they're wanting that type of, um, of letter of support. Uh, if your oncologist is unwilling to do it, you may be able to gain that through your primary care provider like your family doctor or, or a nurse practitioner. Great. And time for one last question. Um, a couple people want to know if there's evidence-based research that points to um, boosting the immune system with any CAM therapies. Yeah. So um, we get that question a lot from across all cancer groups in terms of boosting the immune system. And I always caution people, particularly if you're, if you're dealing with a, with a lymphoma or any type of blood cancer, that you actually you actually have a conversation with your doctor in terms of whether boosting your immune system could actually promote uh, your disease. Uh, I tried to do a bit of research online and I couldn't find anything to directly link that concern to people living with lymphoma, but it's just kind of a background thing to be thinking about. However, when you're undergoing treatment and you're getting near the end of your treatment, you know, people do, you know, realize that chemotherapy and radiation is trying to suppress certain aspects of your immune system. Uh, and they start wondering, how can I, you know, get it back up to a normal level? You know, there's a lot of controversy right now in terms of how we can actually do that and which 
CAM therapies may help us. We do know that there is beginning evidence around the mind-body therapies and having a regular mindfulness practice uh, can boost immune system markers. We see an increase in natural killer cells, T helper cells, when people are engaging in regular uh, um, mind-body therapies. In terms of the natural health products, we're just beginning to understand which of these therapies could help in boosting the immune system. Uh, we don't have strong evidence at this time, though, to pinpoint certain natural health products as having that role. What I really encourage patients to think about is you know, adding the mindfulness to uh, their, their care regime and also thinking about their overall diet and exercise, especially their sleep, which in our society and right now as we all are going to bed and still reading our smartphones or our tablets, we're seeing really disrupted sleep, which we do know that sleep is really important in terms of having a, a strong immune system. You know, if you're interested in, in going down the natural health product route, uh, again, like have that conversation with your oncologist or your family physician about whether it's safe to be boosting your immune system at wherever part of the journey you are with lymphoma. Uh, and then I would consult someone like a naturopath, traditional Chinese medicine doctor, to talk about which therapies they would suggest and then go back to places like Natural Medicines or Memorial Sloan Kettering website to see what the level of evidence is and whether there is support that certain therapies could help you in boosting your immune system. Um, you know, it's, it, it really varies and we're still at that beginning stage of this field to understand what could be helpful. Great. I think that brings us to the end of our hour. Again, I want to thank you, Dr. Balnese, for joining us today and giving us such a great um, overview of CAM therapies. And also a big thank you to all the audience members who attended today. Again, the, uh, the slides are available as hand a handout, and um, we hope to have you back again at one of our future webinars. Thank you. I would love to do that. Thank you, and good luck, everyone. Thank you for joining us today.